Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured. But the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In chapters 4, 5, and 8 of his treatise on truth, St. Anselm is going to be talking about finding truth and examining and analyzing truth in, you might say, places or domains that we don't typically think or talk about truth being in. And those are the will, the voluntas, and action, actio, right, in our deeds, in the things that we actually do. And these are going to be very closely connected, as we're going to see. And action itself is going to be foundational for the other kinds of truth that we have or perceive or, or do. So he begins by talking about truth in the will, or rather truth of the will, veritas voluntatis. And what is this? It, it, this is not a way that we're typically thinking about truth. We can talk about a will maybe being true, as in the sense of like being loyal, but Anselm means something more comprehensive. What is it to have truth in the will? And here he's actually going to take off from a verse from Christian scriptures, specifically from the Gospel of John, chapter 8. <clears throat> he says, Truth itself tells us that truth is in the will when he says of the devil, he did not stand in the truth. And then he interprets it this way. For it was only due to will that he was not in the truth or deserted this truth. And the student responds, so I believe for if he always willed what he ought, he would never have sinned since it was only by sinning that he deserted the truth. He abandoned the truth. And truth was in or of the devil's will before the devil did that. And we don't have to pick on the devil necessarily. We can think about human beings. We can think about ourselves when we're choosing, willing, loving, desiring things that aren't what we ought to be desiring, right? And so this is, you know, quite common. And what is truth in the will? Well, it's a kind of rightness or rectitude, rectitudo in Anselm's Latin. And rightness in, in what sense? Well, every will is being, you might say, measured against the criteria of willing what one ought, quod debit. And we don't have to get too you know, worried here about, well, how do we find this out or any of those sort of secondary questions. That comes up in other parts of Anselm's treaties, particularly chapter 12 and in his many other works. Just assume for the moment that there is a kind of built into the universe, built into the fabric of who we are, a quo debuit or what we ought to be, will, choose, love, hate, desire, all the things that the will does, including our habits, how it ought to be shaped. So truth exists in the will when we are willing what it is that we ought to. So like he says, if so long as he wills what he ought, which is why he is given a will. So there's, there's a, a deeper debit there, right? A, a deeper debere, a deeper what one ought to do. The will was given to us for certain purposes, actually a whole set of purposes, as we find out again through Anselm's other treatises, not just in this very short chapter four. So as long as a person wills what they ought, which is why they were given a will, they are in rectitude and in truth. And when they will what they ought not to, they desert rectitude and truth. And so truth can only be understood as rectitude since both truth and rectitude of will are nothing other than to will what one ought. So that tells us what truth in the will is. 
And as we're going to see, there's the truth that happens when we will what we ought to. And there's also a deeper truth, sort of like the truth in signification, or as we're going to find in action, of what the will is supposed to be for in the first place. When we turn to the next chapter, much, much longer, much more detailed, truth in action, again, closely connected to willing because obviously, generally, you're going to do what it is that you will to do. I mean, there are possibilities where you do something other than what you will to do because of some accident, other causes coming together. But in general, we're willing what we, uh, what we choose, right? What we decide upon and then we act. So again, he'll bring up a scripture quote. And again, it's from the Gospel of John. Truth must also be recognized in action as the Lord says, he who does evil hates the light and he who does the truth comes into the light. Now these are interesting ways, again, of talking about truth and you know, connecting it with other things. And so he says, well, what is this truth in action? And Anselm is going to lead his student through three identifications. So there's doing the truth, veritatem facere, right? Facere is a term that in the narrow sense means to make, to produce, but it can also be used as a much wider, more general term for doing anything in general. And so... Doing the truth is going to be the same thing, he says, as doing well, benefakere, doing the things that we ought to do, right? Doing what is good or what makes things well, well for other people in the world, well for us, well in general. And then he goes on and he says, it's also the same thing as doing or producing rectitude, rectitudinem, right? Facere. And so this is uh, quite an important thing to say. He says, um, here we go. To bring about rectitude and to do the truth are the same. It's clear that to do the truth is to act well and to act well is to bring about rectitude. What could be more obvious then that the truth of action is rectitude. And then he brings in a really important distinction. So just as with in the earlier chapters, there were two kinds of truth in signification, there's going to be two sorts of truth or rectitude of or in action. And here Anselm is going to talk about non-rational and rational action. So non-rational, or it's often translated irrational, although we don't want to get misled by that. It's not action that we engage in that is irrational. It's the action of non or irrational things like, for example, fire burning or a stone that you throw falling to the earth or hitting somebody else in the noggin if they happen to be standing there at the end of the, the arc or, uh, you know, irrational beings like, you know, later on he's going to talk about a horse desiring to eat its food. That's also non-rational action because a horse is not rational. And he tells us that these sorts of things are necessary. They happen by necessity because that's the way that the universe is made. It's this vast nexus of causes and effects and you know, things lead to other things. It's not necessary that the horse uh, eat this particular hay over here. It's not as if that's built into the fabric of all time and space, right? But it is necessary that the horse desire to eat. And if it's there and it's going, it's going to see the hay and it's going to go over there and, and eat it. So a thing does what it ought to do, or even an animal which are a certain kind of thing, broadly speaking, but are sentient and have desires and mobility and all that. So fire burning is a perfect example of this. A little bit later on, he's going to talk about uh, iron nails piercing the flesh of Jesus Christ when they're hammered in. That's 
non-rational action. It's not like the iron says, well, I need to figure out what I need to do in this situation. On the one hand, I am iron and I do like to pierce things and go through them because I'm really hard. On the other hand, it is, you know, God incarnate, so maybe I shouldn't do this. The iron doesn't think, period. It just does what it does. Then we have non-rational action. <laughs> Sorry, rational action. And that is not necessary in the sense that we could do otherwise. We could also call this, to go back to the will, volitional action. Because it is things that we as human beings, in some respect, use our will to choose. It's very interesting to see, and this is a bit of a side note, how closely connect, connected rationality and volition, free volition, are for Anselm. An idea that is not unique to Christianity. We find this also in the Stoics, for example, uh, to a lesser extent in Aristotle and the Aristotelian tradition. But it is really central for Anselm. As rational beings, we make free choices. Doesn't mean that we can have absolutely free choices where we like snap our fingers and the entire universe changes, but we do in fact have some scope of choice, which leads to some scope of action. And that is measured by whether we do what we ought to do. So when we're doing what we ought to do, we are producing uh, truth in action, for example, giving alms. Now, this is an interesting one because Anselm later in chapter 12 is going to talk about the motive for giving alms. If you're giving alms just to look like a big shot for what we call vainglory, well, that's not really uh, truth in the will and truth in action in the full sense. But giving alms itself is something that you're supposed to do. Giving alms, by the way, means giving of your surplus to those who are in need to help them out, right? And that would be a good example of benefactore, benefiting somebody else. So he goes on and he, he, he says that um, every action that does what it ought is fittingly said to do the truth. And so, you know, fire exhibits truth and rectitude when it does what it ought to. And we ourselves do that as well. And he goes on and says, um, this applies not only to actions, but also sometimes to what, what we accept, what, what happens to us. He says, one who wills what he ought is said to act rightly and well, nor is he excluded from those who do the truth, Right. And so this is, is quite important. Now, we go on and we make another interesting set of distinctions in chapter 8. Now, why does Anselm bring this up? Well, because in chapter 7, he has just said, well, there's truth in the essence or being of things. You know, all of this depends ultimately on the supreme truth that's, that is God. So in a certain sense, everything is doing as it ought to be or ought to do. And then we can ask the question, well, how then can evil actions that shouldn't exist exist, right? Evil actions uh, come from a evil will. We shouldn't have evil wills. We shouldn't have evil actions, right? I, we can, of course, because we're rational creatures and we can choose between good and evil. But why does God... Let there be any of that. And Anselm says that God permits some people to do badly uh, and to do badly because they will badly. Male facere quod male volunt. The things that they wrongly, badly, evilly will, they also do. Which is bringing untruth into the world, isn't it? So, why does this happen this way? And here we have to think about the ways in which we can distinguish actions. And one of these is going to be between the non-rational action and the rational action. So let's look at that first. I've already brought this up uh, a little bit earlier. So he says that, for example, um, you know, when, when iron nails were driven into the body of the Lord, 
Would you say that the fragile flesh ought not to be penetrated or that when penetrated by the sharp steel, it ought not to feel pain? And the student says, well, that would be against nature. And so Anselm then says, it can happen in an action or a passion ought to be according to nature, which ought not to be with respect to the agent or the one acted upon, since the former ought not to act and the latter ought not to suffer it. So in the case of the Roman Soldiers driving the nails into the flesh of Jesus, you know, his crucifixion. The iron should do what it does. The hammer should do what it does. The person acting in this case, the hammer driver of the soldier, in a certain sense was doing what he should do, right? He was carrying out a order given by uh, the governor, but... He also shouldn't be doing that. And he is therefore, in a certain sense, responsible. And the flesh that the nail is being driven into, which is suffering a passion, it is suffering an action that is happening, coming from another agent. Should that flesh not transmit pain through the body of the person? No, it ought to, because that's natural. That's what the body does, but this person least of all deserve to suffer the pain. So there can be, depending on how we're looking at things, a yes, it ought to be, and a no, it ought not to be, a truth and a falsity in actions, right? Another set of examples, getting away from crucifixion, but also involving violence. He talks about a striker and a struck. He says, the same thing ought to be and ought not to be. It ought to be insofar as it could only be if God allows it to to be, but it ought not to be uh, insofar as it is conceived by an evil will. Um, He goes on, he says, there are many ways in which the same thing receives contrary appraisals from different considerations. This often happens in action. Striking involves an agent and a patient, so it can be called both an action and being acted upon. Now, with Both of these, the agent and the patient, the sufferer, we can ask, should they be engaging in that action? Should they be suffering that action? So he gives a a few examples of this here. Um, Skipping ahead a little bit, he says... um, When... Uh, an agent and the thing acted upon are subject to the same or contrary judgment. The action itself is judged to be the same or contrary. When the one who strikes rightly strikes and the one who is struck is rightly struck, as when a sinner is corrected by one who has the right to do so, there is right on both sides, which would mean there's truth on both sides. Because on both sides, the blow ought to be struck. It is the opposite when the just man is struck by a bad man since the one ought not to strike and the other ought not to be struck. So on both sides, it is not right, since on neither side ought the blow to be struck. But when the sinner is struck by someone who has not the right to do so, then the one ought to be struck, but the other ought not to strike, and the blow both ought to be and ought not to be. Right. So there are several different possibilities here And there can be truth and falsity in the same action at the same time when we consider it from differing perspectives. So this is a real important consideration. And this makes a little bit more complicated the picture of truth in the will and truth in action that we're seeing. And finally, we come to another key point, which is made uh, at the end of chapter 5. He says that... Um, in the course of investigating truth, uh, the Lord seems to make special mention of that truth, which is in the will. When he talks about the devil, I wanted to consider separately what truth in the will is. However, when one wills what they ought, um, and they act rightly and well, they're not excluded from those who do the truth because willing itself is a kind of action. He goes on and he says, since it's clear that the truth of natural action is one thing and that of non-natural action another, the truth of speech, which we saw above cannot be separated from it, should be placed under natural action. So when 
words are doing what they ought to do. Even if we're using the words to say something false, there's still a certain truth in those words, which is analogous to the fire burning things doing what they ought to do. So for Anselm, what this hints at is that action is actually the larger category of truth that encompasses thinking, willing, and communicating. So truth in those is in some respect either analogous to or even founded on truth in action. Analyzing truth in action allows us to better understand truth in these other modalities.